Okay, That's so happened. second speaker of this session um, is Clotilde um, Cuccinota, who is from Imperial, and she's going to talk about electrified interfaces. So over to you, Clotilde. Thank you. Thank you for uh, this uh, invitation. I'm quite excited to talk to he at this uh, conference. I always liked uh, uh, this um, conference uh, and, uh, and, uh, and to share a little bit of uh, what I'm talking about, what I'm working on. So, um, in general, so the title of my uh, of my talk is "Modeling Electrified Interfaces from uh, First Principles." So, essentially, I will uh, um, try to um, introduce a little bit of uh, about the focus and context of my research, and uh, I also will talk about uh, some of the general issues, uh, open issues uh, that are uh, uh, present in the modeling uh, of uh, uh, electrochemical systems and how to address this. Uh, and in general, in particular, uh, I will focus a little bit on uh, how we address these kind of issues uh, to model a very fundamental uh, and important uh, uh, surface, which is platinum water interface, which is a very technologically relevant uh, uh, um, surface. So we start uh, uh, from the general context of my research. Uh, so you see here uh, represented very different uh, uh, electrochemical uh, devices and processes. So we have uh, energy devices uh, uh, such as batteries, electrolyzers, uh, solar and fuel cells, uh, and we have also memory resistors, electrochemical gating uh, devices uh, for uh, memory and logic applications. And we have also processes like corrosion or ne on neurotransmission. So all these uh, are uh, essentially uh, electrochemical uh, devices and processes. And uh, all these very different uh, uh, devices, this means that uh, all these different uh, devices operate based uh, on the same fundamental electrochemical processes uh, principles, uh, which is the combined effect of uh, applied potential, electric current, and chemical transformation. And these uh, uh, processes, occur at the nanoscale. And so, uh, in order to enable better devices, we need to develop knowledge at the nanoscale. As, uh, um, as uh, uh, Richard Feynman already anticipated in uh, 1959, uh, paving the way for uh, uh, the field of nanotechnology. Um, so let's just uh, uh, think about uh, uh, this uh, uh, artificial leaf, for instance, uh, which is a device that uh, uh, we have now developed and is able to produce hydrogen uh, by exposure of, uh, 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 of the leaf to the sun. And uh, uh, essentially, this device could really enable an hydrogen-based uh, economy. However, after more than uh, uh, 200 years uh, since uh, it was uh, developed for the first time, uh, essentially, we still did not uh, achieve an efficiency which makes this device interesting for uh, commercial applications. And the reason for this is that we proceed by trial and error. And we need uh, a more detailed uh, uh, and deep knowledge on uh, the atomistic mechanism that uh, are behind the hydrogen generation. If we had this, uh, we would be able uh, to, uh, to, uh, to develop a better device and to boast uh, this technological progress. And uh, unfortunately, experiments uh, are uh, hardly achieve uh, resolution at the nanoscale where uh, the fundamental uh, transformation occur. And therefore, we need uh, theory and modeling uh, to address this, uh, to achieve this resolution. However, the problem is that we don't even have uh, a theory to model uh, uh, electrochemical transformation, which is comprehensive and uh, it is able to account for the fact that the electrochemical transformation uh, occur in a uh, uh, potential controlled uh, open environment. Indeed, in particular, 
here we see represented the prototypic model of uh, uh, of uh, uh, an electrolytic cell. Uh, we see that uh, um, the electrochemical uh, uh, phenomenon is uh, uh, is a formidably complex phenomenon where different uh, component uh, uh, think different process uh, kind of processes occur at the same time. So we have uh, uh, we have uh, electric current. Uh, flowing uh, in and out of a cell and uh, uh, sustaining uh, complex electron transfer uh, reaction uh, at uh, interfaces. And uh, uh, um, so uh, essentially, in uh, electrochemical uh, uh, phenomenon, uh, we uh, do not uh, conserve the number of electrons in the in in, uh, in in the system that we are considering, and we don't uh, uh, conserve even uh, the species, uh, uh, the atomic species, because uh, uh, thanks to the flux of these electrons, uh, atomic species are uh, transformed into other uh, into other species. And uh, uh, all these processes, so the chemical transformation and uh, uh, the electric currents that feed them, are uh, uh, strictly interrelated. But actually, uh, the uh, current existing methodologies normally address, can only address a single aspects of this uh, 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 transformation and uh, uh, cannot address the problem in combination and try to um, to uh, to develop uh, theory uh, which uh, uh, enable uh, um, to, to have a more uh, um, intuitive uh, uh, potential control uh, uh, description and modeling of the electrochemical phenomenon that uh, it's at the core of my uh, of my research. Uh, so, in particular, uh, in this talk, I will uh, illustrate how uh, current uh, uh, surface science approaches, which use uh, uh, DFT, uh, which uh, uh, and standard computational setting, cannot really uh, model electrochemical transformation. So, uh, and essentially, as uh, I already uh, started anticipating. Uh, because uh, they are enable, unable to control the potential in a simulation. You see here in the left part of this picture that uh, uh, since the number of electrons in standard, uh, uh, in standard uh, setting is kept constant in the cell, um, the number of electrons cannot change and therefore uh, the uh, chemical reaction are modeled without taking into account uh, the real uh, non-equilibrium nature of electrochemical transformation. Uh, there is uh, uh, another community uh, that is molecular electronics, which uh, community which is able actually to model, uh, to model, uh, to model, uh, um, processes uh, uh, under potential control, typical electronic processes. Um, and uh, uh, at the core of my, uh, of the uh, part of my research is precisely indeed in trying to combine the knowledge from these two fields to enable a, a potential controlled uh, description of the uh, molecular, of the electrochemical transformation. But um, I won't have uh, really much time to illustrate this. I just uh, wanted to, uh, to just introduce uh, this uh, as a general, uh, as a general uh, uh, part of uh, what I do, of, uh, of what we do in our group, in my group, and, uh, and to, to allow me also to introduce uh, what are the activity in the uh, nanoelectrochemistry group uh, that uh, are currently ongoing. Uh, essentially, so um, we uh, in, in, in a nanoelectrochemistry group, we develop uh, on one hand uh, this integrated uh, 
methodological tools uh, for modeling electrical and chemical aspects of electrochemical phenomenon at, uh, uh, in combination, apply these tools uh, to model uh, fundamental uh, uh, electrochemical rea uh, reaction at uh, interfaces, but uh, our approach is to uh, develop uh, more realistic and explicit models uh, for electrochemical processes uh, in operation. And also we apply this tool uh, to understand fundamental uh, processes uh, induced by atomic, then induced by the presence of a potential or a current, uh, but that determines some atomic dynamics. And so the, the, the general uh, uh, the general projects in my group uh, range from uh, uh, energy, corrosion, uh, oxygen reduction, uh, uh, process of batteries, uh, but also electrochemical nanojunctions uh, and uh, uh, membrane stores uh, and sensing. But as I said, uh, here I want to focus uh, uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, the double layer, the description of, uh, uh, of a platinum water interface. And starting from uh, uh, what is the double layer? Uh, the double layer, from a, it's, an important, uh, it's an important structure that forms uh, every time uh, uh, different uh, uh, materials get in contact. So there is a charge uh, polarization which uh, uh, determine the formation of, uh, uh, which leads to the formation of a, a strong uh, uh, electric field uh, interfacial, which is a uh, huge, I mean, it's of the order of million of volts per uh, uh, square centimeters. And, uh, um, and uh, electrochemical transformation occur essentially in this uh, uh, environment. Uh, on its turn, uh, the, uh, this electric field and the double layer structure is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, affected by the application of an electrode potential. Uh, however, uh, uh, so what uh, uh, we want to achieve is a, real, a realistic description of uh, the atomic structure of the double layer, the interaction at this, uh, uh, at this uh, uh, very, important, uh, very important interface. But um, uh, as uh, anticipated uh, uh, before, uh, and then now, now, I, uh, now I'm trying to get a bit more in detail about what is uh, uh, the challenge typically in modeling uh, this kind of, uh, uh, of uh, electrochemical transformation at interfaces, uh, is that uh, uh, in theory, as anticipated, we work with the fixed number of atoms and electrons and uh, with periodic boundary conditions. So it's, uh, I think that all of you know that this means that the system Systems is replicated in all direction in state. And so, uh, because of this, uh, um, wh whereas in experiment, uh, this, uh, this phenomenon is uh, uh, controlled uh, by uh, the application of a potential. So, uh, this means uh, uh, that. Uh, uh, since uh, we have a uh, uh, fixed uh, number uh, uh, of electrons, we cannot uh, uh, provide to, uh, to uh, the system uh, the uh, needed uh, flux of electrons to keep the potential constant during electrochemical transformation. So essentially imagine the hydrogen evolution reaction, this reaction where two protons combine uh, to form a, an hydrogen molecule molecule uh, because they receive uh, an electron from uh, uh, the electrode. Uh, so what happens is that uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, when uh, this electron uh, moved, moves to the, to the, to the, um, uh, to, the, to, to, to the protons, essentially, uh, since we have a fixed number of electrons, the electron density uh, changes, the Fermi level essentially of that electrode changes, and therefore uh, this uh, uh, potential, the chemical potential of the electrode changes while we are simulating the reaction. So essentially this uh, shows us uh, we have an intrinsic inability when we use a system with a fixed number of electrons to model charge transfer reactions action at fixed potential. And so this is uh, uh, the first uh, of uh, uh, the uh, limitations that are associated to uh, modeling uh, uh, electrochemical processes. But uh, let's say that uh, we also, we refrain to uh, want it 
to, to model the uh, electron transfer reaction at the interface. Uh, we have another problem because uh, since we apply periodic boundary conditions, uh, we have uh, a system which is periodical. And so it's difficult uh, to apply a potential to the system uh, because the system, the potential must be the same at the boundary of the cell. And even if we apply, let's say, uh, an external potential, since the Fermi level uh, is constant, uh, it will uh, uh, happen that there will be a charge redistribution uh, in a way that uh, uh, the charge will compensate, will move to the other side of the electrode. And uh, essentially, we won't be able to really describe a potential drop across our system. So this is uh, another uh, uh, problem. And uh, uh, another, uh, uh, so what is the uh, solution to this, uh, to this uh, problem? First of all, uh, what has done the community is just to reflect uh, on the fact that we don't really need uh, to model a system with two electrodes. We just uh, uh, can model half cells. And, uh, uh, and so uh, essentially focus on what happens in half cell and try to model uh, the, uh, the, um, the, the, uh, uh, an electrode in certain defined potential state, uh, which uh, is uh, essentially reflected uh, in a system which is uh, symmetric with respect to the uh, to, to the central uh, to the central uh, to, to its center, and therefore in this way we can model the, we can model the potential drop the potential drop which occurs at the interface and uh, uh, which is an essential component uh, of the description of uh, interface polarization, but uh, we can deal with the periodic boundary conditions uh, which impose the same Fermi level at the boundaries uh, uh, of uh, our simulation cell. And, uh, uh, but uh, how to impose uh, how to uh, impose the pot this potential drop at the interface. Essentially, uh, what we do is to try to, instead of applying a potential uh, to, the, uh, to the electrode, uh, essentially um, what standard methodologies do is to try to charge this electrode and to, uh, and to uh, control the charge on the electron and then a posteriori uh, define, uh, and since every state of charge is related to a certain potential drop, by controlling the charge of the electrode, one can put model and simulate a different electrode, uh, different potential state and different situations and different conditions uh, of potential. But at this point, we have another problem. So the problem is, how do we evaluate the electrode potential? Okay, we manage in some way to charge the electrode, but how do we evaluate the electrode potential? And in this case, there are several uh, recipes that are adopted by the community. And uh, one of these uh, is uh, in use uh, a concept uh, introduced by uh, Tresatti, uh, which is to include uh, a vacuum uh, layer in the middle of the cell and use uh, the vacuum uh, point just in front of the water layer uh, to align uh, to align the potential of the electrode uh, to the uh, potential of the standard hydrogen electrode. Of course, this uh, problem, this uh, introduce uh, uh, the problem of, uh, uh, the fact of uh, um, modeling interface dipoles, but uh, uh, but uh, uh, which are difficult to converge, uh, but at least we know what is the, uh, the state, the pot we can refer by referring this uh, point to the standard hydrogen electrode potential, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the potential of our electrode. Uh, the other... Clotilde, yeah? we've just got a few more minutes to go. Ah, okay, so uh, okay, so I just want to then I go quite quickly through uh, a couple of interesting results that we obtained and just uh, adopting essentially this setting uh, where we uh, essentially try to control uh, the charge on the electrode by introducing uh, a number of uh, species, uh, uh, charged species in solution uh, so that uh, we can, uh, um, as uh, it is done essentially in, uh, in, uh, in 
computational in um, synthetic chemistry. So essentially, uh, people introduce uh, uh, synthetic chemists introduce charged species in solution uh, so that uh, the system polarizes and there is a charge transfer on the uh, electrode. And so by introducing uh, uh, different uh, ions in solution, uh, we manage to model three different state of charge for the uh, electrode. And uh, this corresponded to three different potential drops. And uh, uh, studying uh, uh, what, uh, and, uh, and then uh, which corresponded, uh, uh, so, so this gave us the opportunity to essentially model uh, directly uh, what is the structure of the int phase uh, in the presence uh, in, three, in three different uh, uh, state uh, of uh, potential for the electrode. And, uh, and this uh, uh, taught us a uh, uh, lot of uh, uh, interesting notions, uh, which uh, is, for instance, that uh, when you change the potential onto the electrode, uh, you, uh, uh, the number of water molecules uh, which are in contact uh, to this electrode uh, are uh, uh, changed. Uh, and therefore, uh, and therefore uh, uh, this can uh, affect uh, an uh, the possible reaction like hydrogen evolution occurring at this interface. And uh, another uh, uh, thing I wanted to uh, highlight is that uh, uh, when uh, uh, when uh, uh, this also that, that uh, uh, we uh, we calculated. Uh, um, uh, the mm, coverage, we studied the coverage of uh, hydrogen uh, at the platinum water interface and uh, in this uh, uh, environment. And uh, we studied uh, uh, the coverage as a function of, uh, of the potential. And uh, uh, what we found uh, is that uh, in the presence of a water layer, uh, there is something that was not expected uh, in previous calculations. It's just that the hydrogen cluster together. And they they form clusters that are stabilized by water. And studying the coverage effect around the potential of zero charge, we realized that the water arrangement around the potential of zero charge changes uh, because uh, the coverage changes uh, and the structure uh, and so different uh, uh, type of arrangement of water and different dipole, uh, surface dipole can be induced uh, by, uh, by sweeping through the potential of zero charge. And so this can uh, help interpret uh, um, some uh, anomalies in the capacitance uh, at the potential of zero charge. And another uh, uh, thing that I just wanted to show you is that now we are uh, uh, essentially trying to progress towards a, a deeper and even deeper understanding of uh, what is that, uh, the structure of the platinum water interface in operando conditions. As there are experiments that show that uh, essentially there is uh, a uh, corrugation of the uh, surface which is formed, uh, which uh, uh, occur uh, where there is uh, essentially, where there are uh, essentially pits and terraces which are uh, sort of a couple of atoms uh, uh, deep and, uh, and with pit of about one nanometer uh, uh, large. And uh, we managed to model exactly what happens uh, in experiments uh, during uh, the application of a potential. And uh, an interesting result that we have obtained is that uh, uh, we saw that uh, the property of the edge are very different uh, from the properties of the other uh, system. And indeed, uh, the edge is charged positively and, uh, and there are uh, absorbed water molecules uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, um, on the edge, which... Uh, uh, which uh, um, uh, which occur uh, also at a negative uh, uh, potential. And so, and this can help, uh, can point uh, at different uh, hydrogen evolution mechanisms uh, at the edge and at the surface. And this can explain essentially uh, recent experiment that uh, highlight actually a uh, special role of uh, low coordination sites uh, in these systems. Okay, so this is uh, more or less uh, everything I wanted to talk about and uh, I hope there is at least one question time for that okay thank you thank you very thank much you. Um, so we have a comment um, 
maybe it does not require an answer, but I'll put it I'll put it up. So um and this comes from Andre. Um and he is just referring you to some um recent work that um he may or may not have been involved in. So maybe if you don't know that, that's worth worth taking a look at. Yes, yes, precisely a grand canonical uh, simulation uh, uh, framework that I'm trying to develop. Uh, uh, but there are two aspects of grand canonicity of electrochemical transformation. One is uh, with respect to the electrons, and this is precisely what I'm doing. But of course, there is also another aspect, uh, which is the uh, grand canonicity with respect to the ions. So it's the control of the pH. Uh, and there is a very interesting research at the moment, indeed, uh, and trying to um address uh, that uh, uh, problem as well yeah so thank okay. you yeah okay very good that sounds like it might be a useful um discussion for in the um breakout room at the end of the day so our next speaker is ed smith he is also um from london um from brunel and uh, and ed is going um can you put your slides up, Ed? Yeah, of course. Sorry, just just uh, buffering once again. Um, his title oh. is Molecular Structure at an Interface, um, which is um, intriguing and uh, not sufficiently detailed for me to guess what <laughs> he is actually going to talk about. So over to you, Ed. Can you see my screen? Is that okay? Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much, Angelus, and, and and thank you very much to the conference organisers. So. Um, yeah, so, so my talk today is on molecular structure at an interface. Um, so most of this work was done over at Imperial College. I've recently moved to Brunel. Um, I say recently, it's been about two years, although of course, like most people, I haven't actually been on site. Um, just to give you a bit of background on Brunel, because we're, we're recent partners um, uh, joining this kind of community. We're technically Brunel University London, but you can see we're probably about as far out as you can be and still call yourself London. Um, that's the M25 there on the on the far left and, and just above Heathrow. Um, so we've got a mixture of modern buildings and, and some nice brutalist architecture over in, in Brunel, but it's a, it's a research focused engineering university. Um, so we're, we're definitely more on the continuum methods, the engineering side. Um, we've then got, you know, BCAST, which is the Center for Advanced Solidification Technologies that has some really nice work moving down into the classical molecular and, and some quantum work, um, as well as some kind of experimental techniques that, that involve scanning electron microscopes and uh, things I won't embarrass myself by talking about. I'm purely numerical. Um, with that in mind, I'm, I'm a little bit of an imposter at this meeting because although I, I work in, in molecular modeling, I would say I'm more on the classical side, which I think puts me on the, on the kind of less theoretical end, but um, I'm also really more focused on fluid dynamics. Um, my, my, my training was actually as an engineer. I've always worked with chemists. I was in chemical engineering um, after doing my, my undergrad in mechanical. Um, but, but, you know, I'd say I'm always very much a pretender to chemistry. And the problem with engineering is you always have to talk about making molecular modeling palatable. And the way we do that is, is coupling. So when I talk about molecular structure and interface, I'm talking about a region where we model molecular detail. And then we couple that to what would be a cheaper model for the remaining domain. Um, so to talk today, I'm going to talk about some of those kind of ideas of, of, of linking just the molecular detail near an interface and then move beyond that to um, coupled framework that allows us to extend that and link it to a, a molecular model. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the theoretical framework that, that I've worked on to, to do that um, and then the extension to, to more general interfaces. And this includes kind of liquid vapor, but, but really anything that can be described by a kind of functional form. Um, I'm hoping that this this kind of introduction to, to the general interfaces is also maybe interesting. Um, anyone who's working on molecular stresses, working on um, you know rough surfaces, hopefully this framework again potentially has applications there. And then I'll finish with some some examples of coupled interfaces. So I've kept this fairly high level. I've also put lots of nice videos. So um, hopefully, even if if the topic's not you know directly uh, you know relevant to your research, hopefully this is still um, you know relevant. And then towards the end, I'll talk about some of the limitations where it's clear that the material modeling community is absolutely essential to the problems we, we face in engineering and, and where these can be directly useful to the type of work. Okay, so the motivation, I probably don't need to sell this to the, the community here, but this is really the motivation that, that we use for, for engineers. Um, 
I mean, we all know that quantum mechanics is very limited in, in system sizes. We talked about n-cube scaling. Um, you can get that down, but you're, you're still talking very small systems. Even when you go to molecular dynamics, it's still prohibitively expensive beyond the nano, maybe micrometer if you, if you push it. So whatever happens, we're going to have to do some form of multi-scale modeling to overcome these limitations. Um, and that uses some cheaper method if we want to have a crack at simulating kind of full engineering style problems. Um, so since about the 1970s, and I apologize if there's there's other references people would take as kind of canonical as the first example, but you know, for me, this was the kind of essence of the type of coupling that I talk about to capture the detail of kind of a crack. Um, what you can do is kind of quantum mechanical detail at the kind of crack tip itself. In the surrounding material, you do a, a molecular mechanics type simulation. So the quantum is, is doing a kind of bond breaking at the actual crack. The wider deformation of the material is, is molecular mechanics. And then you have a kind of finite element analysis model in the larger scale. So my research is really focused on doing the same thing for fluids, which is kind of a much less mature subject. Um, arguably the first attempt to do this for CFD and, and, and molecular dynamics coupling was back in about 1995, and there's been lots and lots of work since. So the next natural step is linking CFD, MD, and QM. Um, and I would say actually there's kind of a mission there because I think then, you know, we'd link back to molecular mechanics and, and, and build this in as part of a kind of multi-scale framework. Um, I think this this type of direction is the way things are going. This kind of multidisciplinary research uh, techniques linking together kind of you know different different communities seems to be a way that things are going. And certainly from our point of view, things like nucleation event, flow over carbon allotropes, biological systems, electronics, chemical reactions, and combustion really push the limits of what we can simulate without going to more detail. Um, and so the, the the solution I see to this, and and you know the focus of my research is long term this seamless linking of the, the different modeling scales where you have kind of final coarse graining brought in as required for the problem of interest. Um, from a computer, computational point of view, this is done dynamically. So whether that's GPU, CPUs, or, or whatever comes next, you're spinning up more and more processes to, to kind of take on different parts of the simulation and then dropping them once you've kind of simulated that level of detail. And the picture is one of, you know, quantum mechanics maybe modeling just the kind of the types of problem we've seen today so the near wall region that kind of interface as part of a, a larger say molecular simulation so really it's just that strip near the wall that we would have the kind of detail of, of, of kind of um quantum detail and then that's then part of a much larger kind of engineering simulation where you have continuum detail where it's not important um so this is where the talk the title of the talk comes from we're really talking about modeling the interface of the molecules so we reduce the problem of modeling a kind of big engineering simulation down to one of modeling just the interface itself with, with molecular dynamics and then an even thinner strip of interface with, with QM type methods. Um, the two types of interface I'll talk about are the material surface itself that would be covered with a liquid and then the liquid vapor interface. And this is actually a 3D print of a fitting to a liquid vapor interface um, that I've got somewhere, but, but obviously not, not too useful for a virtual um, presentation, but there's a picture of it. Okay, so, so some examples of solid liquid interfaces. Well. The first thing to note is, is although I'm talking about fluids, one thing you see in a, a dense fluid, the type I'm looking at, is it's much more like a, a solid um, than it is like a kind of dilute gas. So we see lots and lots of structure. And a lot of the key physics is due to this kind of stacking effect. Um, so, you know, we see a transition from the solid behavior down into the, the, the fluid behavior through this kind of you know, region where the stick slip behavior would determine so much of the fluid dynamics and the drag and, and all of your behavior there. So it has a, a disproportionate effect for how thin it is. So we're really interested in looking at the kind of wall textures where we have say different roughnesses, different material properties, different substrates, different chemical reactions at the surface. Um, I worked in a tribology department for, for a number of years and you know things like polymer brush coatings where you can build in different um, properties of the, of the surface um, are, are ways to kind of consider improving drag with those and then similarly with kind of a lot of industrial problems the concept of oil forming films on surfaces fouling gumming it's very important both the overall fluid dynamics but then also that interaction of whether it sticks to the surface whether it you know basically forms a, an attachment there requires these type of kind of interface simulations so everything i talk about today is just plain classical molecular dynamics um, molecules position evolving in you know continuously in, in, in empty space um, the positions and velocities, uh, the velocities come directly from the accelerations and the positions are just the, the integral of the, the velocities. 
And we obtain that just from classical force fields. So Newton's law for the n-body system, um, everything uses my own solver that's just a, a kind of parallelized MD solver um, called Flomol. Um, really simple, Leonard Jones potentials, Feeney springs, if we've got any kind of chains, and the extension of, of SAFT gamma me, which is a, is a nice way of kind of getting very simple molecular models where you just tune the kind of strength of those interactions and the and, and the potentials to get something that's closer to, to kind of different materials and the idea of all of this is to keep the the kind of chemistry and the, the molecular properties simple so i can focus on the coupling framework however everything i talk about you know you can still use in the context of more complicated potentials so the idea is that those individual molecules come together they form part of the domain in this molecular region and then we have our continuum region that's linked together so the anatomy of these kind of coupled simulations is one where your CFD, we're solving essentially Newton's law. Um, just to understand that this, this here is a form of Newton's law, the left-hand side here and this term are basically the acceleration. The right-hand side is the stress tensor, um, which integrated over surface is just the forcing. So you can understand this as being kind of the average behavior of lots of molecules. So the, the time evolution of the momentum of those molecules inside a box is equal to the flow of those molecules over the surface, and then that's equal to the plus minus the, the stress um, acting over the surface, the forces they interact with each other. So this is just a kind of coarse graining, and it gives us pretty good agreement with the MD, provided we have enough molecules per box. Um, enough is a kind of relative concept, but a few hundred usually is, is fine. And then we link the two together by having a, a constraint force. So this would be like Euler-Lagrange equation with a constraint. Um, you know, and, and, and this would basically mean that this, the, the, the MD system is kind of constrained to agree with the CFD, and the two evolve together like that. And then you average your molecular region here in order to get the CFD bottom boundary condition. And the two essentially evolve in a coupled way. And I'll present some results in a little bit, but first of all, I want to talk a little bit more about the coupling framework. So the problem we have here is of linking together a, a, you know, a continuum field, the density valid at each point in space, to a discrete molecular system. You know, and these share the same time and length scales, um, but obviously exist in different kind of paradigms. So, so how do we actually reconcile that? Well, the the, the theoretical framework comes from the work of Irvin and Kirkwood, um, and and this you know essentially follows something very similar to the Dirac formulation of, of quantum mechanics. Um, you have these angular brackets here, which are essentially an inner product with the uh, phase space, um, uh, the particle distribution of the, of the phase space of the system. So it, it gives a kind of similar concept to the, 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 the kind of different states. And a Dirac Delta has the same role, essentially that of transforming a discrete system into a continuous one. So it selects from all possible molecules, we're summing over all molecules here, just the molecules located exactly at point R, and including those in this sum, um, essentially to give you the density at a point in space. So this is nice. It's, it's a mathematically exact statement. It's one that gives you the density at a, at a given point. But in practice, the problem is this, the Dirac delta function is infinitely high, infinitely thin. It's a kind of mathematical idealization. So in order to use this in, in practice in a, in a you know, continuum simulation, we have to basically use an approximation of it. So one of the things I did in, in my work was to, to rewrite this as a weak formulation. So we write it in those kind of average volume form you saw the CFD was written in, um, what's known as the control volume in, in, in uh, fluid dynamics jargon. So we integrate the Dirac delta function exactly um, to get a bunch of heavy side functions. And this turns out to have some nice properties. So the Dirac delta function, the integral of that is simply just a heavy side function. Now, if we do this between two fixed limits, what we see is we get a function that is basically zero until you get to X plus. And then it's one until you get to X minus. And then that X minus heavy side function switches on and, and turns it back off again. So this gives you what is essentially called the box car function a function that's essentially only one between the limits x plus and x minus in, in a given direction. Now we do this in three dimensions, three integrals, and we end up with, with a function that's essentially um, the product of three boxcar functions that gives you just a, a molecular selecting function that's only one inside a volume. Now what's nice is this is valid for fluid and for solid. Basically, if anything's in that volume, it's counted. If it moves out, it's not counted anymore. It also has a nice property that if we take the derivative of it, the movement of the molecules, say the derivative in the x direction, it captures just molecules moving over the x surface. So in this case, the kind of flux of molecules as they cross that x surface. The derivative in the y direction would give you the y surface, z direction would give you the z surface. So 
this is quite nice because it, it actually also gives us a form of what is called known as the molecular stress. So, you know, pressure or, or stress, which are kind of equivalent quantities, um, is a key molecular quantity to, to kind of couple to the continuum picture. You know, we always talk about stresses in continuum mechanics or pressures. Um, in fluids, typically we have to subtract the streaming component of fluid flow, and we have a larger thermal component, but the principle is exactly the same. So we know the stress is, is non-unique in a molecular system. You know, we define some plane where we want to measure it, and at least in classical mechanics from the work of Schofield and Henderson, they show that, you know, the, the interaction path is, is not uniquely defined. And there's a whole range of different, you know, interaction potentials that potentially could exist. And so, you know, this is this is one area where this framework at least has some advantages. Um, because we're talking about an integrated volume, what we get is, is something that basically just captures when particles cross the surface or when interactions cross the surface. When the particles cross the surface, that gives us a kinetic theory uh, contribution. It's very similar to Boltzmann idea of particles bouncing off the surface. The configurational part is essentially just the, the strength of interaction crossing that particular surface. Um, and then we address this non-uniqueness problem by actually having a closed box, which means although you know the interaction potential is not you know uniquely defined, it has to cross one of the boxes. So even if the, the potential did something different, we would at least still catch it on a different surface. And even if it, it, it kind of went very eccentric or a bit, we would at least get it on one of those surfaces. So it, it has that kind of advantage of that. So, okay, so all, all of this is just a way of saying, you know, we, we developed or have a framework here where we can write the, the, the molecular system in the same way as the continuum. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, the, the change, Newton's law in a, in, a, in a volume plus that stress. And so then we can derive a constraint that uses the, the form of stress as a kind of, uh, in an Euler-Lagrange equation to kind of apply a, a controlled stress to the system. And we can average the, the velocity in a control volume here in order to get the, the, the bottom boundary. And they're both now written in the same fixed reference frame. So this is nice because it allows us basically to take the system and evolve it as if it's a single coupled system. So this is an example of, of what's known as coet flow. Um, but you can think of this as just being the top boundary of flow in the fluid. So the CFD region has some flow and it drags the entire system. And what you can see here, the black lines are kind of the analytical solution. Um, the red points are the CFD, the values in each of these cells. The green points are the, the average velocity of the MD here. Um, and what you can see is, you know, the, the bottom of, of the, um, the CFD, the boundary condition is obtained from the average of the molecular system. So we essentially get the average of the molecular system here, and that's, you know, giving the bottom boundary condition. And then we're constraining our, our uh, MD to be the same as the CFD, and the whole system evolves together. So the key point here is that we've now got a system where our CFD can have some flow, whatever that is, and we have it linked now to the, the MD system. So whatever we want to apply as a kind of overall engineering flow from an engineering CFD simulation, we can then look at how that affects a molecular interface. So some, some ways in which this kind of can be used is we could look at, say, the rough surfaces we talked about before. And you can see already this has an effect on the, the point at which the velocity is zero. It has an effect of shifting it up. And this is the same as adjusting the, the, the what's called slip length in our molecular system. So it, it shifts that up there. And we can look at, say, posts, for example. This example is quite severe posts, so we don't get any kind of flow within those, but it has an effect of shifting those up. We can look at our polymer brushes example, and you can see there's a kind of complex coupling between the flow, which has a, an effect of dragging the flow back itself here, and you get a kind of retarded flow profile as a result of those polymer brushes. So this has an effect of maybe um, adding extra drag or, or potentially reducing the profile. Another application that we were looking at was, was basically coupling a flow over graphene. Now, classical potentials typically um, have slip lengths that, that may vary by orders of magnitude, depending on, on which one you use. In continuum mechanics, it's very, very difficult to model this. So one area we were, we were looking at using kind of QM um, detail was basically putting that within just this kind of first layer here in order to improve those um, graphene, uh, graphene water interactions just to that surface, and then putting that into larger scale simulations. So the idea of all of this is to, to start to build it into to kind of um, engineering simulations. And typically when we talk about you know, fluid dynamics and engineering, we're talking about turbulence. And this is an example of what is the smallest scale of turbulence. Reynolds 400 would take about 300 million molecules if you, if you model it directly. But essentially this captures the kind of essence of the problem of turbulence that you would see in say a chemical reactor or, or in some situation where maybe you've got a catalyst on the surface and you've got the kind of complex flow above it. 
And so the idea would be that we could, you know, model that whole system and look at how that turbulent flow then interacts directly um, with this here, which is a coupled simulation. The, the, the top of the, the MD here is being constrained by the CFD and being driven in such a way that what we actually see at the wall itself is the, is, is the kind of flow that that surface should experience. So it's a way of essentially applying kind of, you know, full scale engineering fluid dynamics and seeing how that affects uh, molecular systems. So recently I've been working on an extension to this kind of framework and, and this takes this idea of the, the, the control volume function and just adds a kind of varying potential to it. So we just add to, to each surface a kind of uh, varying function. I've shown it for two dimensions, uh, y and z, but you can think just varying in y here. And so this has the effect of, of a boxcar function that is essentially you know, switched on here and then switched off here. Um, and similarly here, it'd be switched on and switched off here. Ed, um, so, just a couple of minutes left. Yeah, of course, of course, okay, perfect. Um, so, so we can use this kind of idea to basically look at liquid vapor interfaces, which are kind of molecularly rough. They vary over time. And you can see here, you know, the Fourier surface we fit to that. We can do using a, a range of different coefficients. We can fit that surface um, exactly. And then we split that into a grid of different control volumes. And we can apply that same idea of basically working out the, the fluxes over the surfaces. And, you know, the mathematics is slightly more complicated, but we get exactly the same quantities. And the result is an exact balance of our various terms. So you get your kinetic configurational stresses, as well as terms due to the movement of the surface itself. <coughs> and so th this is all moving towards, say, an extension to a coupled simulation of interfaces. So we would model essentially, you know, CFD, around the interface and the, the liquid vapor interface will be modeled itself. And so bringing both of these ideas together, we have this, the, the solid wall and this would be a droplet spreading on a surface. And so you'd have a solid, a liquid and a vapor. And this is the kind of three phase contact line. And again, we can consider extending this to, to include say quantum mechanics. Um, the other final example is just one of nucleation. So this is if you have a rough wall um, and we have heat conduction through that wall, we would see formation of a bubble. The bubble would grow and nucleate in the valley and then eventually grow to a larger scale. And if we consider this as a kind of rendered isosurface, you can see, you know, at regions in space, we start to see the formation of bubbles. Those bubbles grow and then eventually um, spread out for, for a given um, region and eventually coalesce together. And so we're, we're interested in basically taking that same idea and modeling that, um, you know, in a molecular system, which adds all of these different features. And this problem has many areas where I think, you know, we, we need to improve our classical modeling. So, for example, the, the conduction in the solid, the interaction of the fluid and, and the liquid are absolutely determined by those QM details. And then the details of the structure of the material, again, are, are absolutely essential. And this would all be part of a much larger simulation where the bubble itself, the dynamics initially are important, but the growth of it beyond that point is as well. So, you know, these, these are very much the, the kind of problems industry are very interested in. Um, uh, just the last mention is the software th to do this is, is basically um, open source. So if anyone's interested in using that, let me know or, or helping develop. Um, it's based on MPI. It scales pretty well. And it's it's just designed really to link into your existing code and just exchange information and, and set up topology between the two of them. Um, yeah, so that's it. I've, I've talked about molecular structure and interface. Um, the idea is a local region that contains molecular detail linked to a much larger uh, continuum framework. The coupling framework I talked about is an Eulerian control volume, and that gives you a form of molecular stress, and it can be extended to more general interfaces. Then I talked about some of the examples of coupling, where we can basically build molecular detail into a, a larger scale continuum simulation. And I talked about some of the limits of that classical picture, where I believe you know the, the detail of many of the kind of techniques we talk about today can be um, incorporated. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ed. Um, we have a couple of questions, so we're falling a little bit behind time. So let's try and answer them as quickly as we can. So there is one here um, from Venkat, and I want to show that on the stage. Um, so he has a confusion about the, the total stress tensor of a periodic system. Is it well defined and unique? Isn't it not? Yes. Yes, yes, fully agree. Um, that this this purely is um, the, the non uniqueness comes when you start talking about the stress tensor in a non periodic system. As soon as you talk about stress tensor in a in a local subset of that system, then you have that problem because you're essentially cutting off. Okay. 
Okay, and I'll put the second one on, um, which seems like it, I don't think it will involve a yes, no answer. Um, so you can read it out. Okay, so and, think, I didn't understand the MD, continuum coupling very well. The MD stress should be coupled to CFD, but CFD becomes a constraint boundary conditions. Um, so the form of coupling ends up being essentially, um, if you use the Euler-Lagrange equation and you work through, you end up getting a term that is is essentially in terms of stresses because weirdly enough, when you, when you work through the mathematics, it seems nature wants to apply a, a differential form of the constraint that ends up being the stresses. So what you end up doing is subtracting the existing molecular stresses and replacing them with the CFD stress field. Um, that's just the form you get from working through a kind of um, minimization of, of the, um, the constrained dynamics with that. So um, that's how the stresses appear in those equations. In terms of the boundary condition you pass to the CFD, that is up less clear what you need to do. Um, and you can pass either velocities or stresses. And there's a whole literature on that. Um, I hope that answered the question. OK, thank you very much. So um, thank you for the interesting talk. Ed, um, I think we should move on. Um, so I said we were falling behind, but maybe I sounded a bit Swiss there um, because I we're not actually that far behind. We're pretty much on time. But um, but our next speaker is, I think, Swiss. Um, and he is um, Basil. Um, I never know how to pronounce your surname, Basil. So can you say it for us? Kurshaw, so yes. <laughs> OK, very good. Um, and he is in Durham. So over to you, Basil. Great. So thank you very much, uh, Angelos, for, for uh, the introduction. And thank you also to the organizer for giving me the opportunity to talk about some of our research uh, at Durham University. So you will see that as compared to other talks, we will move to some rather small system at the moment, maybe trying to go a bit bigger. But the main topics that I'm interested in uh, is excited state dynamics. So looking at when a system absorbs light and get promoted in an electronically excited state. And what I would like to do to start with is just to give you a brief introduction about how we simulate that at the molecular level when we want to actually break down the beloved von Oppenheimer uh, approximation. So the dream in our group is to basically do this little scheme that you see here for a molecular system in its full dimensionality. So what we would like to have in this plot that shows nuclear configuration on the x-axis and electronic energies on the y-axis would be to look at a molecular system originally in its electronic ground state and vibrational ground state. And we're going to excite this molecular system with a short pulse of light. And that will promote the system into an excited electronic state upon light absorption. The system very often in the case of short pulses of light, will now be described as a nuclear wave packet, so a linear combination of the nuclear eigenstate of this new electronic, uh, electronic states, and will acquire a certain dynamics. This will bring the system close to a region where electronic states can come close in energy and even become degenerate, where then the nuclear motion will couple the electronic motion, breaking down the bond upon approximation and leading to this kind of splitting of the nuclear wave packet between different electronic states. So this is really what we would like to be able to describe. This process, see the time scale, see what is happening, the kind of chemical reaction that we can trigger by light absorption. However, when I show you this picture here, I have to really mention that this is an absolute challenge in the context of theoretical chemistry. Why? Because if I want to like do this for a molecular system, what I'm basically telling you is that I want to solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation for a molecular system, okay? So with my electrons here, nuclei and time. So we know that already the electronic part in the time independent way is already complex for molecular system. But now when I show you that, it's pretty clear that we need to do a lot of approximations here. So one thing that we'll start to do is to try to find a more convenient way of talking about this molecular wave function here. And we're gonna do that by using here this so-called bond one representation where we express the molecular wave function as this summation of an infinite number of electronic states of a product, the electronic time independent wave function, that is the solution of the time independent Schrodinger equation for the electrons, multiplied by a time dependent coefficient that we will call the nuclear wave function in a given electronic state. 
This bone one representation is nothing but the picture that I showed you here, where we have nuclear wave function evolving on electronic states, and the electrons are basically just providing us with this static potential energy surfaces. But by looking at this Bowman representation, what we see actually is that we will have to deal with different set of problems. First of all, we will need to deal with the electronic structure problem. So how do I get these potential energy surfaces, not just for the ground state, of course, but also for the excited states? I may also need to compute some other quantities, like the so-called non-adiabatic coupling vectors that describes how an electronic state I can be coupled to an electronic J via nuclear displacement. So that's the actual non von oppenheimer terms here that mediates the transfer of nuclear amplitude between electronic states. We will need also to describe the environment, being it this laser pulse or a solvent around our molecule. And last but not least, we need to describe this nuclear dynamics. So how the nuclei are going to move, because the breakdown of the von oppenheimer approximation very often reveals some of the quantum nature of our nuclei. So it's pretty clear at this stage that I will be looking for a compromise, a compromise between a computational efficiency, because I would really like to see the molecules in their full dimensionality, but also the accuracy of the method that I will use. And I will be very happy at this stage to have a rather robust method that can give me at least a qualitative uh, idea of the dynamics of a molecule in the excited states. So what are the existing strategies to perform such non von oppenheimer or non-adiabatic molecular dynamics? Well, we can for sure solve the nuclear time dependent Schrodinger equation exactly, or at least on the grid, and obtain here uh, some actual wave packet propagation. So that would be the quantum dynamics aspect with methods, for example, like multi-configuration time dependent Hartree. And that's, of course, the ultimate dream if one can describe our molecular system, say, in a limited number of the, uh, degrees of freedom. However, this will get quite expensive if you want to look at molecules in their full dimensionality. And very often, you will need to pre-compute the potential energy surfaces and inject some a priori knowledge about your system to select the proper modes that should drive your excited state dynamics. So at the other end of the spectrum, what you can do, actually, is to say that this nuclear wave packet could be represented by a swarm of classical independent trajectories. So that's at the heart of the method called trajectory surface hopping, which is maybe one of the most commonly used strategies to do excited state dynamics. So the idea is to start here with some initial condition on a given excited state, and you propagate classically this trajectory on these excited states, and based on some equations that will measure the degree of non of your dynamics, you can use a stochastic algorithm to tell you whether you have to stay on this state or to jump to another electronic state, in this particular case, on the ground state. Then you take another initial condition and you run the trajectory. Now, this time, the stochastic algorithm will maybe allow you to carry the dynamics on this excited state. And you carry on with a lot of independent trajectories. They have no idea about each other. And you hope that at the end, the distribution of your trajectories should somehow mimic the nuclear wave packet splitting that I described earlier. But that's mostly a hope because what, the fact that we use this independent trajectory approximation makes that the dynamics per se will be approximated. So there are actually another set of family of strategies to do excited state dynamics that try to mix the both uh, aspects of quantum dynamics and trajectories. And these strategies use the idea of trajectory basis function to express a nuclear wave function. So what are these objects, these TBFs here? Well, you can just picture them as multidimensional Gaussian that you will use here as a basis to express your nuclear wave function on each electronic state. So you have this trajectory basis function here, and you have a coefficient that gives the importance of this Gaussian on your set. So just for a little schematic here, imagine your, your original nuclear wave function here, and consider that I can use three of these trajectory basis functions or Gaussians here to describe this, this, um, this uh, uh, initial wave packet. What I will do then is to allow these Gaussians to talk to each other, in other words, to exchange some amplitude here via these coefficients. But at the same time, the Gaussian will be allowed to move in phase space. Why? Because I would like this Gaussian to behave as a moving grid, trying to follow my nuclear wave packet dynamics. And therefore, when I do that, I will be able to actually have a sort of grid following my nuclear wave packet dynamics, and I will be able to have a rather good description of the transition and the transition of my simulation. So the way 
we move this Gaussian will define the method we are using. If we move the Gaussian based on the variation principle, you are using the variational multi-configuration Gaussian or VMCG approach. If you move this Gaussian along errant phase trajectories or mean field trajectories, you are using the multi-configurational errant phase MCE approach. If you move this Gaussian along classical trajectories, then you are using the full multiple spawning FMS approach. It is important to note at this point that if you have a large number of Gaussian that are covering your space, you don't care about the way they move. And therefore, all these methods in the limit of a large number of Gaussian should converge to the numerically exact method. But in the following, what I would like to focus on is on this full or ab initio multiple spawning strategy. The idea of full multiple spawning is to describe a nuclear wave packet as a linear combination of frozen multidimensional multi Gaussian. So you would start your dynamics here, a bit like in surface hopping, with a Gaussian here, with a given initial conditions, and you will propagate this Gaussian classically on this surface. Now, when you reach a region of non adiabaticity here, what will happen is that you will spawn a new function. So it's different from surface hopping where you jump. Here, you keep your Gaussian on the excited state, but you create a new Gaussian down there. And the two Gaussian will be able to talk to each other via the time dependent Schrodinger equation and exchange naturally some coefficients. And you can spawn as many Gaussian as you need to describe the transfer of amplitude from one state to the other. One important aspect of the full multiple spawning is the fact that you can basically derive it from first principle. So if you use this definition here in the bond one representation that I described before for the molecular wave function, and you plug everything in the time dependent molecular Schrodinger equation, you can extract a time dependent Schrodinger equation now expressed in an electronic and in the basis of this moving Gaussian functions, where now the C's are these coefficients that you have here. And what is very important to realize is that these Hamiltonian matrix elements that you have here will allow the Gaussian to talk to each other. So we move beyond this independent trajectory approximation that we had in surface hopping. If we were to use an exact coupling, so this exact Hamiltonian matrix element, I will do the full multiple spawning, but we have actually to approximate this matrix element to make it tractable for on-the-fly dynamics. And that's when you approximate this Hamiltonian matrix element that we are talking about the ab initio multiple spawning here. So just to summarize, if you had quantum dynamics here, if you use this set of limited number of Gaussian function and they are moving according to classical trajectories, you do full multiple spawning. And then by doing some approximations on this matrix element that I don't have time to describe in details, but very happy to answer that in the questions if you want, what we reach here is this ab initio multiple spawning method that we can use for molecular system. And this strategy has very exciting features. First of all, it's highly flexible. We can extend the method to include, for example, external field or spin orbit coupling, if you want to look at internal conversion and inter-system crossing in your state dynamics. We know where the approximation of the method are, so we can test them, we can challenge them, and we can make sure that our calculations are well converged with respect to those approximations. As we couple the trajectories, we actually move a step beyond the surface hopping approximation. And the method being based on on-the-fly uh, calculation, we can easily couple it, for example, with graphic cards to make this calculation faster. So we've, for example, been playing a lot with some real size molecule using GPU accelerated electronic structure calculation within this ab initio multiple spawning. For example, this dimethylaminopenzonitrine molecule here, provitamin D, or here, an atmospheric molecule. So I, we have a lot of work going on on atmospheric chemistry here. I will stick more to the method development side, but also very happy to discuss more about some of these applications later on, if, if you fancy. So what are actually the limitation of these strategies? And in particular, if I want to look at bigger system or system with a higher density of states? Well, the big problem is, of course, this spawning. Because ab initial multiple spawning can actually spawn a lot of these Gaussian functions. And the problem is that as all these Gaussian functions need to talk to each other, the number of electronic structure calculation per time step will scale formally quadratically with the number of these Gaussian. Okay, so the calculation can become extremely rapidly expensive. This is just to give you an example with ethylene, a six atom molecule here. Of a, so that's a real uh, dynamic. So it's just to kind of show you the number of Gaussian that can be spawned. So you have the number of the label of the Gaussian here, and you have time by going down. So you see that you spawn a second Gaussian, third, fourth, five, six, seven, eight, and very rapidly things get absolutely out of control. And that's a rather small 
Ames dynamics that you see here. So now imagine with a larger molecular system or where you have a higher density of states, this will be a big problem if we have to carry all these Gaussian together. But if you look at an excited state dynamics done with ab initio multiple spawning, what you will re realize very rapidly is that actually these Gaussian, they don't always be very, very strongly coupled. They have the tendency to kind of move slightly away from each other and becomes only weakly coupled. So we could think of a sort of death penalty, considering that when they are only weakly coupled, these Gaussian, we could actually propagate them independently. And that's one of the ideas that we came up with very recently that is called stochastic selection ab initio multiple spawning, and it works as follows. So you start with your initial Gaussian here, and you propagate it until it starts to spawn a new Gaussian. Now, the two Gaussians are coupled via this dashed line. The darker the line, the stronger the coupling. And you carry on your simulation, and it may happen that one of the Gaussian, or more than one, can move away from each other, resulting here in a weak coupling with the other, other Gaussian. So what we could do is to define a sort of threshold where we consider that Gaussians are only weakly coupled. The threshold can be based on the overlap between the Gaussian. We can compute this analytically, so that's very easy to get. Or the Hamiltonian matrix element that, as I remind you from before, is what couples with the trajectories in the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. So we define a threshold, and we define that when we reach this threshold, we kind of investigate what's going on here, and we look at which trajectory basis functions are coupled and which are independent. We compute the population of the different groups, so the population of this group, the population of this group, and we throw the dice and select stochastically one of the family. What we do after is simply to discard the other one from the dynamics, and we carry on the simulation here only with re the remaining one. What we would do after is to restart the simulation with the same initial condition with, with a different seed for the random number generator, such that we have a chance to maybe sample now the other branch. The approximation is, of course, that we think that this branch here will never meet again with the other one, which may be fair for multidimensional systems. So how does that perform? Let's first start with this very simple molecule, protonated formaldehyde here. And what you have in this plot is time, and here the population of a given excited state. This is the second excited state, and this is the first excited state. What you have in red is an ab initio multiple spawning that has been fully converged. So you see the decay here in red, and the blue and the gray lines are just different tests of this, uh, of this stochastic selection ab initio multiple spawning. The blue line being just rerunning the same initial condition without even trying to converge this stochastic algorithm that we now define. And you can see that in both cases, the stochastic selection ab initio multiple spawning actually falls within the error bars of the ab initio multiple spawning. More importantly, if you look here at the average number of this Gaussian, in the case of the ab initio multiple spawning, is growing all the time, while with the stochastic selection ab initio multiple spawning, it actually remains very close to one. So we managed to quench this massive spawn of Gaussian functions. That's a rather simple system. Let's have a look at another set of systems. So we tested the, these strategies and compared also to surface swapping on this cyclopropanone molecule, fulvine, and dithene. Fulvin is a rather nasty case because it shows some limits of the surface swapping. So I'm just going to focus on this one here. And the next part is slightly busy, but I will just drive you briefly through it. What you have here is once more time. And in the lower panel, you have here the population of the first excited states. If you look at the black line, which is the ab initio multiple spawning, you will see that the first excited state hit a conical intersection and becomes depopulated very rapidly. And there is just a little revival of population on the S1 state when the wave packet goes back and comes back in the region of the conical intersection. So if you look at surface hopping and whichever form and taste of surface hopping that you use, this revival here is overestimated. Now, looking at the stochastic selection aims based either on the Hamiltonian matrix element or the overlap, all these methods here are actually perfectly in line with the ab initio multiple spawning. So we do not lose the accuracy in describing the non abiotic transitions because we only decouple the trajectories when they are far apart from each other. Now, if you look here, we have the number of electronic structure calls for each of these methods. So for AIMS, at the beginning, the dynamics is rather cheap because we have only a very limited number of these Gaussian. But as soon as you start to spawn, this is a log plot here, you see that it gets more and more and more expensive. The dashed line that you have here is the fully converged surface hopping calculation. And it's linear with respect to the number of trajectories because they are all independent. 
Now, look at these two curves that you have here. That's the stochastic selection of initial multiple spawning. And you will see that while it's a bit more expensive in the region of Noyabati City, it oscillates and is sometimes even cheaper than surface hopping, while still preserving the description of the initial multiple spawning. The only thing that we still don't like here at this point is the fact that we need to include a new parameter, this epsilon parameters, which is to kind of gauge when trajectories are becoming uncoupled. And we would like to ditch such a parameter and try to find a very simple way to do a cheap version of this ab initial multiple spawning. So that's the challenge that I uh, gave you. Uh, yes. Just, just a couple of minutes, please. That's perfect. No problem. Yeah. And that's a challenge that I gave to one of my PhD students, Yuri Glassman. And he actually did a nice observation that the overlap between our Gaussian function always decays as a Gaussian. Therefore, it would be possible for us to predict for how long, in theory, this Gaussian should be remain, should remain coupled without having to actually fix a given threshold. And he used this strategy here for what we call the ab initio multiple spawning with informed stochastic selection, which for all the model system that we've been testing, if you compare the red line with the black line, provide an extremely good agreement with the ab initio multiple spawning, and at the same time here, always remain less expensive than the original stochastic selection aims, which means that it's even more competitive with respect to surface hopping. So this is just a sort of take home message here. I hope that I could introduce you to this ab initio multiple spawning uh, methods and convince you that is a very interesting method in the context of describing the exact state of dynamics. We are building now a sort of hierarchy of different methods based on this framework, using the possibility to select some of these Gaussian. So I mentioned this S uh, stochastic selection aims and the ab initio multiple spawning with informed stochastic selection. And that actually could be used as a sort of complementary strategy with surface hopping to look at larger molecular system or molecular system with a denser uh, uh, number of electronic states. So with this, let me just thank you the people who did this work. So the work that I presented today has been done by Lea uh, Ibalip, so a PhD student in my group, and also with Yorick, another PhD student in the group. I would like to uh, thank all the people who contributed uh, overall to this research project, the funders, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Valio. Very nice talk. Um, so we have one question uh, so far. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, so very clear talk. How do you determine the threshold? Can you give an example, yes. please? Um, I guess you mean in the stochastic selection. I, I, would, I, would, I would think that this, yeah, okay. Um, so in the stochastic selection case, what we would simply do is to just do some test runs. So you would start with one of your initial condition and you would just propagate it and you will see which kind of coupling you observe in your dynamics. Everything is monitored so you can learn if you want from, from your dynamics at this point. And then what we would do is to try to converge one of these initial conditions with respect to this threshold, which is actually a rather cumbersome uh, thing to do. That's why we really wanted to ditch this, this parameter, uh, this threshold parameter as, as soon as possible, because it highly depends on the system that you're looking at. So some systems have the tendency to have more Gaussian remaining together. Some other have Gaussian leaving very rapidly. So that's the reason why we wanted to remove it, but it's basically by a trial and error based on a few selected initial conditions. So not a very, very um, nice uh, way of selecting these kind of parameters. Okay, thank you. Do thank we you. have any other questions? No, I don't think we do. So I, I was just wondering in, 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 in general about, you know, the, the, the computational cost and uh, system and sizes that are practicable um, and and what you can do now, what you hope to be able to do in a few years time. Could you make some comments on that? Yes, so so at, at the moment, in particular with this stochastic selection, we can we can quite easily do the same size of molecular system as what you would do in surface hoping. So with a slightly more rigorous now um, algorithm. So one of the big problems that we will experience uh, is actually now the use of these strategies if you have a, a dense number of electronic states. And that's one of the, the problem that we try to tackle now in the context of this stochastic selection. Because of course, now every time you want to kind of move a state, uh, you need to kind of spawn new functions, right? So some ideas have already emerged from the the, uh, the Aaron Fest version of, um, 
of this trajectory basis function based approaches, so MCE, where they perform some cloning of the Gauss of their Gaussian. Uh, I think that with this stochastic selection, we could manage to kind of also recover some of this information. We will try to kind of look at metal complexes now. It's a bit now some tests. I would say molecular system of the size of what you can do with surface hopping up to like 50, 70 atoms is something that we can do at the moment. And hopefully in the near future, we can grow that and make it a bit bigger. <laughs> but it's still like, a, let's say, it's, it's, it's still a method that needs to go in hand with a surface hopping for larger molecular system, I'm afraid. Yeah. Okay, very good. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you, Basile. Um, so our last speaker of this session is uh, Valentina Aristova, and Valentina is in Edinburgh. Um, and can you share your screen, please? Um, and the title of the talk um, is Environmental Sorptive Materials at Molecular Level. And you should have the correct display and Looks good. And uh, you should see me as well and hear me. Thank you very much for inviting me um, to tell you about what interests me um, in uh, the world of uh, science and how I'm approaching it through uh, my methods that are molecular dynamics. And you've heard a lot about methods so far. Um, I will take you back um, after Basile's very fine um, molecular level uh, to a much more um, bigger systems. And I'll talk to you about um, DIRT and how I feel that um, my skills and knowledge of molecular modeling and a bit of geosciences can help um, to answer some of our big problems uh, in um, as a society. So I'm interested in various type of DIRT. And when we think of DIRT as something that gets our hands dirty, um, and how we can use it um, to clean up after ourselves, humans, and what we are producing around us. So I'll talk to you about two types of um, things that uh, get us um, kind of mucky is uh, smectite clays that we know um, as we know clays uh, around us everywhere. It's a swelling part of mud that would kind of makes this mud all slippery and, and, and expand whenever it rains. And the other one is uh, biochar that's becoming a very popular material um, nowadays. It's basically charcoal extra. Um, and it's, um, it is charcoal producing specific uh, conditions. So first of all, um, what is soil? Um, so we walk on soil, we use soil um, for to grow um, various things, we build on it, um, but if we look at it, I mean, uh, as a molecular modeler, it might be a bit of a bigger, big scale. So what's what's in the soil? So we've got around 50% of it is air and water. And then the other 50% of the top soil, at least, would be um, mostly minerals and then some organic material in it. So if we look at the minerals, um, uh, geologists would normally take the different variety of meshes and we'll start sieving it through. Um, we'll get to the low level that will be sand, silt, and around 10% would be clay. The clay itself being only 10% in this even smaller part of it would be um, clay minerals. Sounds like a very small amount of the total soil that's surrounding us. Nevertheless, it's that coating um, part that we can see here surrounding all of the um, all of the bigger sands and um, and silt particles, it's coating everything. So it's actually what is interacting with everything else that ends up in the soil, um, such as various pollutants um, or something we'd like to keep there, um, uh, fertilizers, etc. So for example, this is a very simple kind of educational uh, plot where we're looking at two types of soil. One of them has got 8% of clay in it and another one has 27% of clay. That's quite a high amount of clay, um, 27 general for soils. And we're looking at the phosphorosorption and you can see how much higher is the phosphorosorption with a higher amount of clay. And this is um, from perspective of fertilizer. I would like to have some sort of clays in our soils to be able to grow uh, well on it. 
So also, uh, since it can absorb um, and retain uh, certain compounds in the soil, um, humans have figured out a long time ago that um, clays can be used for uh, cleaning. And that's how we came to Fuller's Earth. That's um, bleaching earth. And it's been used a lot for a while in the production of the clothes. And that gave name to the very uh, large group of clays, smectite clays that are swelling clays and um, it comes from the wipe off of green. And if you're interested in the historical um, part of it, there's is a really interesting, good article to, um, to look at. So as a molecular modeler and what it is molecular dynamics, very simple, no tricks, as you know it from, from I want to say from school, from university. Um, so, but the most important part, as I see it, is to be able to model those materials, those minerals in a representative manner that we can then go and compare to what's going on around us. And I'll show you, hopefully you'll see it through this talk, how very small perturbations in those structures lead to very big changes. So for that, uh, to be able to construct the model, I will be normally going to this Clay Mineral Society uh, webpage that will present me with um, source clays, so it's the clays that you can buy, um, and they're well analyzed and we know their composition. That means that the experimental work that could be going alongside or already published would very often involve those clays. So it's a very good starting point. So I go in there and I find a lot of materials. So for example, sodium marillonite, and I get this kind of structure. And this looks like hell for any modeler because we don't really know where to, <laughs> where to put all of these ions and substitutions. So for this, I've got amazing Hannah, who's a PhD student and um, started this year. And she's focusing on developing those various clay models and making sure that um, what we have and what we model is representative of the what we can compare to experimentally and of the clays that are of interest. So I will just show you quickly what, when I'm saying clays um, to you all the time, um, what they are. So this is a typical structure of the clay uh, where uh, we'll have yellow is going to be a siloxane layers. So there'll be two siloxane layers and then there'll be an octahedral layer where normally we'll have aluminium or magnesium, which then would be substituted. So here the, um, the aluminium is substituted for iron three. So there is no charge difference and two magnesiums. And that gives us rising of a charge. Um, there is not many substitutions in the siloxane la layer. So it's only octahedral. And this little small charge per unit cell will have to be counterbalanced with something that is here is sodium or calcium. So it's a Wyoming montmorillonite. It's known to be sodium montmorillonite. Um, those ions have got the hydration shell, so they will be surrounded by water molecules. And then depending on the amount of water in the surrounding, they can swell or shrink. Hence, you're swelling mud. Um, some clays would have only a certain limit of swelling. Some could swell as much as, <laughs> as, as they can in the surrounding water. This is driven by those ions and the charges. So you already start to see how a very small changes. So here is just magnesium going in the octahedral layer will give rise to the swelling properties. So this was montmorillonite. Another common clay is um, nontrinite. And again, it's got the exactly same tetrahedral, octahedral, tetrahedral um, layers. But you'll see already from just this figure how much larger is the naturally kind of occurring gap between the layers in it. And this is coming because of the ions that are present and because of the charges that we're trying to counterbalance. Then we've also got kaolin. That's a kaolinite clay. You would know it, I'm sure, from just use around. Um, and this is a different clay. It's a non-swelling clay. Um, it's got only um, tetrahedral, octahedral layer. There's no other tetrahedral. There is no interlayer water. So it comes in a slab. Um, it doesn't really have a charge. Nevertheless, having um, one of the siloxane surfaces, so this is the top yellow one, and the other one is octahedral um, aluminal surface, will be hydrophilic. The, the um, sil um, siloxane will be hydrophobic. That creates a little bit of a dipole in it, and the surfaces are very, very different. So depending what it's coating, it will have either one or another exposed, creating a very 
interesting uh, behaviors. Similarly, similar uh, tetrahedral octahedral could also kind of curl into this modulite and um, nanotubes that could stack again together. And there's a lot of interesting um, fist chemistry going in there. So um, Hannah is basically working on creating those, um, those clays, making sure they're representative and how we can create the perturbations depending on what we would like to look at. So um, let me just show you very briefly an example when um, just very small changes of um, ions could already um, get you to um, different phenomena. So here we're doing like um, dynamic metadynamics, putting off ions um, from the surface. Um, I'm sure people in the audience know this method um, where we're testing different ions. And um, for each of the ion of the not uh, of the uh, we'll find the energy minima and we can see how it's sitting on the surface. So here's the surfaces on the left and what is the um, hydration shell around it. The implications here um, from a study like this would be um, that the ions are um, will be captured or allowed to move through with the soil groundwater. And this is just an example of a smectide holding uranyl ions, um, so the radioactive ones in its layers and how it swells. So we do have <laughs> documented um, uh, documented kind of part uh, to, um, to this study as well. So this is a bit of a giveaway. Uh, so when we're talking, so I've, I've talked to you about the ions in the in the soils and for as an example of radioactivity. Um, and of course, there are also clays um, outside of our planet. So um, the one of interest is Mars. And as you would have heard for sure that we found Martian clays and we got really excited about it because it means that there was water on Mars um, at some point. Also, it's very interesting from um, origins of life perspective when we're looking at preservation of the material that would be normally um, degraded under the UV radiation. So this is just an analysis of um, various clays present on Mars. This is just a surface. This is a delta of what used to be a river, and the colored parts are various clays. Unfortunately, we don't know what's there, so that's when modeling can be very useful. So from just the analysis of their their Mars, that would be the non-trinite. Um, clay that I've already mentioned before, where we've got um, siloxane layer, again in yellow, and then we've got the octahedral layer mainly dominated by iron in iron 3 and iron 2, and there is a giving rise to charges. But on one of the non-trinites that we know, um, and it seems to be quite an interesting um, uh, for, for this um, uh, for the Martian hypothesis, we've got a lot of charge coming in from the, on the siloxane. While the other potential one is not trinite, very similar in all of the parts, but the charge is much more distributed between tetrahedral and octahedral sites. Then we've got um, ions uh, present around, and like on Earth, there is a dominance of magnesium and calcium that are divalent ions. So um, we can model this and from our perspective of space exploration and finding some organic materials, for example, um, we would like to see if we can find some biomarkers well preserved within those clay layers. So here um, I had um, Sarah uh, who did some project uh, in my group and what she proposed to do and then done it was to model this uh, non-trinite clay as a hypothetical clay for a Martian surface, uh, from the best of our knowledge <laughs> of, um, of what is the composition. So she took these two types of nitronite, as I've just shown you, and then she looked at the glycine molecules at some reasonable, what we thought would be concentration. Um, glycine is atrotorionic at the pH 7, and um, it would normally readily degrade under normal Martian conditions. So the question is, if we land a mission on Mars, sh where should we dig, or where should we land it? Which kind of clays should we go for to be able to find some biomarkers? She looked at the calcium and magnesium cations, and that's what were the finding. 
So comparing the just the two nitrinites, um, so Nl1 and 2, and magnesium and calcium, and the absorption of the um, of the amino acids on top, she could identify whether the absorption was one via, via outer sphere or inner hydration sphere, giving the certain ions. And knowing what is the mechanism of absorption, we would be able to know how mobile are those organic molecules on the surface, so whether they'll be likely to be retained or they'll be more likely to be moved with any surface water that could be present there. So just in case, <laughs> there's a little reminder of the inner and outer hydration sphere. So here we've got clay layer that's been just flipped. So it's vertical instead of horizontal. And we've got this negative um, clay. Then we've got inner sphere bound directly to surface and out sphere when there is a, a hydration shell around. And she found that in the same case for two different clays, with magnesium versus um, on one another, there's a very different distribution. And again, it changes for calcium. From this, looking at the results she got so far, and we are going to look, also confirm them experimentally. If we had a mission to Mars to land now, we would say to land where there is more calcium present, as it will be more likely to, to protect and maintain those amino acids in the interlayers if there are some. So this would be our best bet. So um, back to Earth, because we have got some problems on Earth as well that we haven't um, looked at and we're already on Mars. So I will now tell you about the other uh, interesting material, very tacky, that is charcoal, uh, biochar. And it comes from biomass. Uh, where we take various biomass, and here is beautiful, beautiful pine cones, but in reality it's any organic remains of anything we as humans have as a waste on the side. Then we burn it in with lack of oxygen, sometimes um, controlled amount of oxygen uh, for different, different temperature, for different lengths of time, and we get biochar. Then we there are loads of applications and there are some modifications that could be done to this biochar. And the modifications basically come into um, what do we put into biomass and how do we burn it? Or maybe it's something done after production, but sometimes it's followed by another kind of burning uh, process. And this is Rosie, who's uh, doing her PhD and uh, working out <laughs> basically how do these things look at molecular level. Because before we know how it looks at molecular level, it's very difficult to understand why it works, how it works, and how can we make it better. So if we look, as I mentioned, uh, biomass would be sitting here um, on the oxygen to carbon and hydrogen to carbon ratio that we'll be getting from mass spec, for example. So biomass takes kind of this area, coal, our normal coal would be just um, reduced amount of oxygen um, to the carbon ratio. And then biochars would occupy the whole entire big band here. And as the level of maturity and processing increases, they kind of go down the slope at some point overlapping with various carrigens, um, which are present in the oil wells, coating oil wells. And this is just for comparison, the carrigens that are quite well understood structurally, because oil research is much more um, rich than others, um, just for giving us an idea where we're looking for. Um, she looked at the biochars, trying to explain it as a chemist and trying to model it, um, understanding what is the meaning of the production temperature here on this axis in Celsius, and um, also aromaticity index or degree aromaticity because all of those terminology kind of comes in together and it's, we need to decouple and understand what it means so entirely aromatic carbon would be here um Valentina, we've just sorry for interrupting yeah. we've just got a couple of yeah, minutes thank you i'm that's great perfect <laughs> so it's sitting here and then the degree um, of aromatic condensation so how many rings are together um are kind of giving us this band then we're also looking at what are the functional groups and how do they change with temperature. Of course, we're burning some organic material to produce something else. Um, and this is kind of how they deplete with temperature. 
and what are the likely groups to have at a given stage. Okay, so this is kind of all collective knowledge that's coming from various, uh, various experimental techniques. Um, so she set up to set up these three um, biochars uh, product produced at this temperature. Um, she's taken um, this um, ratios from literature of hydrogen to carbon and oxygen to carbon that would correspond to a given a percentage of aromaticity. And we've also defined polyaromaticity as number of conjugated aromatic rings kind of coming together. There is density, and that's another interesting uh, part in how do we measure it, and the functionality. So putting this all together in a box um, resulted in these structures. And while we're, um, so you'll see here the ring size is kind of marked by colors and you can see how many kind of come together and here's just a few and there are loads of functional groups while here is a bigger islands and of course this kind of gone a little stacky. So we wondered if it is too layered and what can we compare to? And that was a difficult question. Um, and then we looked into some TEM, uh, TM uh, images um, and looking at the different paralysis and different conditions and what it looks like um, to understand what structures it would have. And we kind of concluded that we need to introduce different functional groups, different ring sizes here to be able to get the similar morphology and similar curvatures and the gaps within the materials, kind of comparing the two. And that results in those three structures produce a different um, different temperatures. So far, this is the best guess of a chemist of what's going on inside the char. And we're now applying it to, um, to test the performance against the lab performance for absorption of, um, at the moment, aspirin is a really well-known compound for testing the biochars for the remediation. So with this, I hope I've shown you some of the applications of various type of materials that we think is just tacky and dirty and how their structures are very interesting um, and how we could use them and understand their structures, model them to improve them further and to apply um, for various problems. Um, and this is the group. So Rosie and Hannah um, are activity students um, Owen, Jackman, and Carolina, I haven't spoken about their work. If you're interested, I can tell you a lot. There are more applied stuff um, that they've done looking at pollution remediation. They were um, in the group last year that was all online and very odd. And this five amazing um, undergraduates have got their fun funding to do some uh, projects over summer. Um, and thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please. As me, I'm sure you know. I'm gonna get me out of the thing. Stop screen sharing. Okay, I don't yeah. see any any questions yet. Um, so, um, you know, one question from my side is is um, you didn't say. Uh, or I, I missed the details on the force fields that are used. I guess for the clays, you're using something like clay FF. And yeah, stuff. so um, you, maybe my question is, you know, what what do you think about the sort of accuracy of those approaches? And uh, so yeah, so we'll basically talk? yeah, this is this is really good that you're asking this because I've just finished analyzing yesterday some data set that made me very happy. Um, so we are using clay FF, and I've tested also. They're not much as you might have guessed. Um, there is clay FF and then there is interface, basically. Uh, so we're using clay FF that is very simplistic, as it sounds, but um, strangely enough, it gives quite good um, results. Um, I've just looked at the gas absorption um, of basically the uh, formation of the layers versus the vapor pressure for the hydrocarbons um, using clay FF and using, uh, we're, we're using charm because of those force fields are mixable. Um, mm -hmm. And my, <laughs> so basically from which I then looked, compared it to experimental data that we had um, and calculated back the, um, the parameters from there and we were in a really good match. Okay, 
Well, that's very encouraging. Yeah, yeah it, 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 it made me happy because we were always were quite happy with the results we were getting with Clever. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but that just made me extra happy. <laughs>